Hey guys, Alicia from Morning Hawk Creations here. Today's tutorial is actually going to be a walkthrough of a speed demo of a ginger tabby in pastel. The piece is called Desmond. I hope you enjoy. Alright, so these are the two reference shots I have of Desmond. Uh, the second one here uh, has a picture of him with a stick. That stick is later going to become a prop that we're going to use to do some storytelling with. Now with pastels, when you're layering in pastels, you always have to start with your lightest values first. So we're going to start his pupils with a royal blue color and then move into the black because I really want to give his pupils some sense of depth. If I layer the blue on top of the black, it'll look flat. So I need to start with blue, move in with black, and go back and forth. When doing his uh, irises, we have to go in with our lightest values of yellow again. Not necessarily the brightest, but the lightest ones that I really want to go for. And then accent them with the uh, values of yellow ochre as we move in. Then moving in with an accent uh, pencil, this is actually a charcoal pencil that we're going to define his, um, the side of his uh, pupils with, um, which really make them stand out because the charcoal pencil is that much darker than the pastel. One of the things you have to be very careful with, with working with pastels, to make sure you do not muddy your colors, and you can do that very easily by when you use your blending stumps, uh, effectively cross-contaminating your blending stumps by using uh, your uh, blending stumps for different colors. So you would want to really keep your blending stumps separate between your, uh, your yellows and browns and oranges and then your blues. For this project I think I had about eight different blending stumps for each family of colors. And as we go in with after defining the uh, the eye itself, getting in the uh, mid-tone values for the uh, fur, and kind of defining the first set of markings around the eye. Now what I don't want to do is use more pressure with pastels. I want to go in and kind of work that into the tooth of the paper with a blending stump rather than putting more pressure on uh, the pastel pencils themselves. These are really basically just chalk pastels, so all I'm really going to do is cause fractures and fissures in the pastels rather than actually gain the same uh, result that I would if I had a, a colored pencil or an oil pastel. And layering with pastel is really the name of the game. Uh, you have to start with your lights and go back and forth, layer and blend and layer and blend. And that way you're going to get that that really deep, deep value and that deep uh, realism that you're going for. The other thing I would have to say is that, uh, especially with doing eyes, you want to make sure you keep your um, areas really, really clean, uh, keep your pencils really, really sharp, and be very gentle about how you use them. Uh, using an excessive amount of pressure is not going to help you. It's going to cause you to snap uh, the pastels in the shafts of the pencils and uh, cause you to go through quite a bit of product rather than get the uh, deeper color that you desire. And it's not uncommon to go through um, some surrounding area and then decide that you want to add in some color Um, as you go back and forth uh, in and out of the eye several times and it's not just uh, one or two colors um, there are five different colors of yellow that I'm using in this project uh, three colors of orange um, I would say about four different values of a yellow ochre kind of or a, a kind of browned yellow and three values of white, one of which is a cream white, one is a really true white, uh, several values of gray, 
and then several values of like a uh, reddish brown almost sienna color and there is a, a really huge jump back and forth and back and forth in order to attain the uh, the uh, depth and the texture that I want to get with it. And I am using two different brands of pastel. One is Cretacolor and the other brand is Carbothello. Now the Cretacolor I bought um, at Hobby Lobby as a set. Um, I believe it's a set of 24. And those have all defined colors. Unfortunately, when I went to the art store and bought the Carbothellos, they weren't designated a color as much as they were designated a number. And so um, it would be really hard for me to go back through and go, oh, well, I'm using this particular color of pencil because A, this is really meant to be a speed tutorial, and B, I don't really remember which pencil I grabbed, and because I'm going back and forth between the Carbothellos, which are color coded on the outside, and the Creative Colors, which are not color coded, it would be impossible for me to tell you the right color. Now, on this part of the face, um, it almost looks like I'm being counterintuitive and going in with some of the darker values first, and then going in with some lighter tones. And while that seems counterintuitive with working with pastels, because you can't go in and really layer a light color on top of a dark and have it show through real well, those are the ones that I've really defined to be accent points or parts of the anatomy that I'm really not going to want to have lighter, and I don't want to accidentally make that mistake and lighten them up too much. So uh, definitely going to go through and accent uh, the, uh, the edge underneath the uh, eye socket and the marking, which um, defines the uh, cheekbone, any stripes um, in the forehead, and really going back through and using the full uh, spectrum of all of the pencils to the best of my ability. Now this piece did take me 24 hours roughly, 23, 24 hours to do. Um, I really took my time um, and the client was, she was, she's, I don't even know if she's still around. I do apologize. I, I don't know. I know her grandson's probably around. Um, his father's around. I have not met either one of them, unfortunately. And... Um, it was more her story that really sunk with me. Um, her daughter was an art teacher and an artist. And after she passed away, um, the son uh, was kind of left alone. Not so much in the way that uh, he didn't have any parent figure, but he didn't really, he was too young to really know his mom. And so the grandmother really wanted to make sure that he knew the value of art. And so she would take him to local art exhibits, local museums, um, to make sure that he kept uh, some sense of value of art in his life. And so this picture became a really big thing. And I sat down with her for several sessions, as I do with my clients. Um, because it, it really true is what they say. It's not about the art itself. It's about um, the story that goes with it. And I, I can't emphasize that enough when I'm teaching students that um, it's in what your clients say because in truth it was not so much in the memorial of the daughter as it was in the integrity of making sure that um, as he grew up and to be a young man, that he remembered all the lessons that she was trying to imbibe in him as a young boy. So notice how I kind of went in here real quick, and I did touch it up with a little bit of blue, and I'm kind of trying to re-emphasize... Um, that 
uh, the white highlights in the eyes. Um, and the reason I'm using the paper is to kind of keep my hand for tracking uh, pastel back and forth. But even then it still pulls off and doesn't hold to the tooth of the paper, which is why I keep going back through and I'll touch it up every once in a while and know some place where it, it wiped off or it, it wasn't quite as strong as I would like it. So just like in all other mediums, the best way to convey amount of texture is to have a lot of contrast. And sometimes you can use color to convey contrast. Sometimes you see your lights and your darks. So in order to convey the velvety softness of the bridge of the nose versus the back of the head, you have to blend it in real soft and really use the maximum amount of the tooth of the paper in by the bridge of the nose and then show some of your strokes as you get back through into the back of the head and the forehead and the ears. Now notice how we went from just that two tonal value to using quite a bit of tones um, from one eye to the next. You can really watch how it, it develops its own depth. And there is a lighting difference because I believe that the light source was coming more from, as you're looking at the piece, more to the right than from the left. There's more of a shadow on the left hand side, but it also shows greater color value on the right side as well. And ginger cats have uh, pink skin, and so the trick was to combine that pinkish skin tonal value uh, with that yellow and ginger colored fur without it washing its, you know, canceling each other out. And do you know that, yes, I do go back and forth. Uh, with the uh, kind of brighter yellows and then work it into the, uh, the paper with the blending stump and then go back over with some more texture. And I'm not trying to really grind it in and completely consume the tooth of it because I do want to layer in other colors. So with pastel, uh, really a, a little bit will do you in the pressure department. Um, you don't really want to grind all of this into the tooth of the paper because once the tooth is full, it's almost impossible to, to get the tooth back. And you can, uh, much like you can with uh, colored pencils, where you can get that wax bloom with uh, pastels. You can fill up the tooth of the paper and then you can't really get much more layering with pastels. So I would definitely say one of my tips with pastels is don't use too much pressure. Less pressure is more to your favor. Another thing that's kind of important to learn as we're going through this is to understand how your color mixing goes. Um, and I did do a, a video on color mixing. However, that applies to not just acrylics or watercolors or colored pencil. That applies to all of your mediums to understand how uh, contrasting colors will gray down values, um, 
how blues and pinks can combine to uh, a purplish color and it combined with a brown uh, can make flesh tone where um, as you might be tempted to just use black um, using your color mixing rather than relying on uh, just using straight black can give you some much richer values It's about this time that the client called me and she was very upset. Um, she had decided that even though in the contract she had asked for a realistic portrait, which clearly this is being rendered as a realistic portrait, um, she felt that maybe she wasn't giving her grandson the benefit of the maximum of what an artist could do and that doing some kind of stylizing would probably be good for some storytelling. Um, she was quite upset and I did schedule another session of, uh, of an appointment with her so we could talk about it because I did already have this much of the cat done. This was four hours worth of filming and four hours worth of work that had already been done. I really didn't want to have to trash this piece and then go back and redo it as a stylized piece. And after talking to her, um, I asked her if she trusted me, which I very rarely ask my clients if they trust me, um, because it became one of those things where it was just as much the emphasis, the storytelling, and we got back to this whole thing where it was more of a legacy piece where she wanted some life lessons brought back to him um, after she was gone. Uh, she didn't want him to ever forget that she was there. Um, or any of the things that she really wanted him to learn. And so the decision I made was to kind of take this piece as a realism piece and complete Desmond's head as a realistic portrait and then employ some factors uh, that I normally would not apply and that is um, some more cartoony kind of sketching um, elements and it was based as much on distance from the viewer as it was in ability to tell a story. So we're going to keep with the very very um, rich colors with the browns and the oranges um, and the yellows in order to get the rest of him done and then we'll kind of walk you through how we transition down into kind of a, almost a cartoon sketch kind of thing. So a little bit of the pinks and some oranges into his nose. And then just carrying the highlight from his nose into his fur a little bit. Don't really want to get a whole lot of hard edges. And for all the fact that these cats have a mixture of different colored fur in their uh, coats. Um, there has to be an overall tonal value that you're going for. So it's okay to bring one or two white hairs out, um, but your darker values are going to wind up pushing back, which if you note now how I brought that ear back by adding in the, uh, the umbers and the siennas, um, and we're going to push this cheekbone back now um, by giving it some shadow. I don't know if there is the really decided um, line that has been drawn for brand names as far as um, 
Carbothello or Creed of Color, I can honestly say outside of the fact that the Carbothellos, which were shipped separately, versus the Creed of Color, which were set, shipped off as a set, um, I liked both brands and I was really impressed with this piece, the way both brands performed. Um, the only thing that I was really kind of upset about is about um, several of the Carbothellos were broken, and uh, but they were easily replaced by the manufacturer, so it was due off to shipping and the, the way that they were shipped to the art store that I bought them at. So carrying his colors and his coat down into his lip. And of course you have the, the pink that you have to carry down into his lip where his skin shows through. Defining his nose a little bit more. I wish I could say that there's like great things that were happening, but unfortunately, um, this is just kind of the part where we're going from transitioning from his realistic portrait into uh, the stylized thing. So instead of keeping with all of his bright, bright colors, uh, we're starting to gray down into just the charcoals. make sure that we have the uh, highlights and the values in his nose right. I hadn't totally decided for sure at this point if I was going to make his paws realistic, so I really wanted to make sure that I could get his head as realistic as I could. And then it was kind of a debate about how we were going to uh, bring the transition down as smoothly as we could into the rest of his, into his body, because he was a uh, full body piece. Well, the biggest, biggest problem I had was trying to figure out uh, at what point to cut off some of these bright colors, which is why you often see me uh, pausing as I'm trying to reevaluate the, uh, the color balances and determine at what point we should start cutting this off and then deciding that, no, no, I really wanted some more rich colors in there so that when you, the color did fade off, that it, it really, the, the face stuck out a lot. emphasizing some of his markings. And bearing in mind when you're doing some of these markings, it's not just one, one straight line and one color. Oftentimes, even just in these ginger cats, uh, there's five or six different tones you have to go through in order to make that one line on that cat look like it's actually um, realistic. So now we're just kind of graying out some of his, his natural color and that has more to do with storytelling than it has to do with 
um, his actual picture if you wanted to go back on the uh, original reference picture you can and as I said the uh, the Carpathellos were breaking quite a bit so there's a several shots in here where you'll see the pencils just break down from me trying to use them as I was using the uh, Krita colors As you'll hear me through several tutorials, what I'll say is if you really want to be able to execute a piece well, and you want to be able to execute a subject well, start by executing it in black and white first and then move into color. Color is one of the hardest things to learn how to do uh, because you have to understand uh, the subtle things that have to do with getting the perfect tonal value and how light affects color and how your eye interprets color. Doing things in black and white is much more simpler um, and being able to understand how a picture translates into black and white is one of those uh, talents that I can't emphasize is an important enough feature uh, in learning how to execute things properly. It gives you a very good uh, discipline and understanding of light and balance and positive and negative space. So by the time we get into this uh, shoulder area, we've eliminated a good chunk of the natural color that this cat has, and we've washed him down to black and white. And there is a reason in the storytelling for this, and it has to do with the fact that reality can come across as overwhelmingly harsh. Um, sometimes you just feel like you can't get away from it. And at the same time, things that are off in the distance don't pop out at us as much as we would like. Um, so we did go into this more stylized thing so that things that are in the forefront are the things that pop out. And that things that they are still attached to seem to fade off into the distance. Um, now we did go back and forth with this, which was... It was quite a challenge, and I really enjoyed it, um, because by the time we get to Desmond's back, um, he literally is just a sketch. And that is, it was a lot of fun to be able to just get real loose on the same picture that I f focused so much realism on. And the reason that the... Um, the bar underneath Desmond's paw in the reference picture that was used is so important is because we change it by the time we actually get to executing that bar we turned it into a pencil and the reason is is that I wanted I wanted this boy to be able to take with him one of the lessons that nothing's forever um, everybody mis makes mistakes and you can always go back and change it um, nothing's in stone, nothing's forever, and you have control of, of everything that you do. Um, if I decide that I don't do any more tutorials, then if my YouTube channel fails, then it's all on me. If you decide as an artist that you don't want to practice at your chosen medium or your chosen field, um, then, I mean, whether you succeed or fail, it's all in what you choose to do with that which you've decided you want to do. But you can always change it.
So I still used a little bit of the more gray versions of the same brown um, and the umber colors in order to carry the the impression of that coat color through. Otherwise, it would have looked completely detached. And again, a lot of layering in order to build up the effect of uh, the 3D and his coat and his proper anatomy. I did do a tutorial on pause uh, because it does seem to be a subject that pet photographers, um, and by pet photographers I mean owners who shoot their pets, uh, they don't really think about pause when they're taking reference shots. A actual pet photographer will because they'll want the entire um, animal in the shot and either it will be a um, cognitive choice to include or to not include feet. Um, but often a pet and wildlife artist does not necessarily have that choice if given a reference picture by the owner, but I have seen several owners um, give artists uh, reference pictures and then have them make up paws and make up anatomy such as ears or tails. So if you're interested in that there is a, another video just on feet. Specifically I believe it's cat feet. but. I believe there's like seven or eight different positions that are, some are very common and some are very dynamic, so. I'll just give Desmond a little bit of a, a background to sit on. At this point, the background is less important than the cat himself, so what the point of the background is in this whole exercise and doing this background is just to make him stand out and look less cut and paste because after all he does have some of his um, foreground that has to have some kind of merit. Now you'll notice that I didn't put any whiskers in quite yet, and that's because I kind of want to establish um, the contrast that I'm going to have for his whiskers. There we go, and there are the whiskers in. Now notice how many times I have to go over these whiskers in order for them to stand out. And actually, after I wind up clear coating and sealing this, I have to go over them two or three times and then even touch them up a little bit with some acrylic paint. So um, just be aware of that with you're doing a, a light coat over a dark coat with pastels that um, getting your light colors to show up on top of a dark background is going to be one of those things that is going to be a challenge. So again, using some of the uh, cool grays and blues in order to dial back the color values without losing the contrast values. Um, so we can go from uh, the colored to the black and white. While keeping the realistic uh, style.
And because they're very similar in consistency and execution, it's not uncommon for me to mix uh, charcoals in with pastels for a richer and more pure black. Because there's so many different hardnesses of a charcoal pencil uh, between the actual carbon pencils and like a 2B or a 4B that um, it's not uncommon for me to grab a, a charcoal pencil just to emphasize an edge or to get a much more pure black in a piece. So this is more of the larger body shot, and yes, I literally am working on upside down right now because I am uh, less worried about the way I'm looking at it, because I actually am more concerned about how much I am going to be dragging my wrist over the piece. One of the challenges with pastel is that once you lay down an area, um, you really don't want to go back over it because you can actually track it back onto your hand and ruin your piece. So you may notice how I have put in way more details than I have guidelines. Um, now, as um, a friend of mine who also does tutorials says, um, there really is no wrong way of doing it. If you use uh, effectively to trace out an outline, that's not going to determine the quality of your work. It's just going to determine the quality of your outlines that you start with. With clients, I if I have to go off a reference picture in order to maximize the amount of time I can spend on execution and less time that I have to focus on anatomy, I will often use uh, my computer and some acetate in order to get the general anatomy lines out. But that does not mean that um, I am solely focused on that. That does, however, leave me a lot of time to put in uh, smaller details such as tonal value and shading and texture. Guidelines are one thing, but they cannot completely execute a piece. Because Desmond was so young when this picture was taken, there wasn't a lot of the characteristics that you find in older cats, which would have made him a more characteristic piece. Um, 
some of the the things such as hair that would go in the wrong direction or um, a scar a patch of fur that would be mass missing or a patch of fur that just doesn't lay the right way um, in fact I think Desmond was about uh, six or seven months when this picture was taken and I'm sure by now he's got quite a few adult characteristics and uh, adult characteristics that make him unique however um, a lot of that was not if if that was present at his age none of it really carried over into the reference pictures I was given um, as the reference pictures I was given literally were taken off cell phone which are very very small pictures and they do not translate well for uh, enlargement So translating some of that darker value, some of the umbers and the siennas into those golden oranges. And we got to bring some of that color down into his feet. So laying in some of the uh, yellow ochre color, kind of. And then going back through and then continuing to bring the uh, grays in. So I do not want there to just be a dead stop. A little bit of cream and a little bit of the duller, uh, darker actual ochre color. I sat down with the client um, approximately five times for the five different sessions uh, about her and her relationship to her grandson and about this piece and I listened to her stories and um, the stories for artists who have have clients get them to talk learn about your clients learn about their pets and their relationships to their pets because I promise you that affects how you render those pieces if I literally just copied um, exactly what she gave me I wouldn't have nearly the fantastic piece that I came out with um, it wouldn't have been nearly as impactful to the family um, I wouldn't have had nearly the ideas that I came away with from it uh, and I wouldn't have nearly enough of a basis for really doing a lesson out of this um, and it's more about um, getting to know your clients than it is on the execution um, this cat originally was just holding I think it was a part of a, a hanger um, Desmond was is obsessed with hangers that's what I was told he would walk around with stuff in his mouth all day like a little dog and by the time I gotten out of 
um, the third session and we decided to do a mixed media where well, I shouldn't say a mixed media, but a mixed style uh, where we're doing realism and kind of a stylized realism. Um, it became important for me to make sure that we had some element of creativity in this piece. So Desmond, instead of holding a rod, which is squished into the carpet, is holding onto a pencil, which literally was a pencil I grabbed out of my own rack. Um, little yellow pencil that every kid has in school and every kid can relate to, everyone can relate to a little yellow pencil uh, with a pink eraser. And it's like the first tool we're given to write with, it's the first tool we're kind of given to draw with outside of crayons. Um, I probably could have given Desmond a crayon, but uh, I'm pretty sure if I gave a cat a crayon it probably would have had something close to teeth marks in it so but the other thing that was the reason for the pencil and not the crayon is that you can't erase a crayon it's really really hard to get crayon out of paper and I wanted part of the story to be very important that was um, he can you know he can determine what he does in fact, there's the pencil I'm using. <laughs> so nothing like drawing from life. Um, but that I really wanted to be able to, to for for um, for the the grandson to take home with him was that um, in the end of the day that he can he can make up his own reality and it's how he interprets his reality that should be how he perceives his his, his time it's not all black and white it's not all overwhelming color it is what he makes it and it is what everybody makes it that's why Desmond's holding a pencil And of course, in order to make it look like Desmond actually had the pencil underneath his paw, I had added a little bit of shadow that wasn't there. And really give him a, give that pencil its own little emphasis. I never really would have thought of something as simple as drawing a pencil that would have had such a reaction but the fact that I had taken the time out in order to, to to just not just translate I could have taken Desmond's head put it on any cat in any pose but I chose to kept, keep Desmond's pose and translate it into something that the grandkid could use um, in his own way um, for things well after um, he graduates after he gets married and things that he can pass on to his own kids for more than just art so in this way that he not only gets to to keep his grandmother with him after his after she passes and keep the memory of his mother alive but that um, he takes some important life lessons with him also and as promised, we did a little bit of stylizing, so we're going to keep some real rough lines here. Had to do this thing where I actually had to remember that I had to move the camera for where I was moving. Because I was moving so fast at this point that it's hard to remember that, oh yeah, I have to move the camera.
laying in the color first and then going in with a blending stump, of course. With charcoals and pastels, it's more important about layers rather than pressure. Now I very easily could have just left Desmond with a black and white background and not really carried it over, but I wanted emphasis on the distance that is between Desmond's face and the foreground, which is the pencil, which is why um, we're using the positive and negative space um, so much in this piece. I wanted this to be as if this was a message from perhaps his mom who has passed or his grandma who was still there at the time and has may have passed by now um, would be one of those messages that transcends through the ages that you take with you. Now this is basically just uh, something that the owner wanted um, it's one of the reasons why it's so easy for me to remember the cat's name and um, not so easy for me to remember the, the granddaughter um, or the uh, grandson's name, I apologize. And that is that the grandson was very much into uh, army and military stuff at the time. He, was, he would have army men all over the uh, bedroom floor. And it was not unusual for her to find little green army guys underneath the uh, refrigerator that Desmond had put underneath the refrigerator, which makes me think of a uh, Bill Engvall skit, from, you know, the IG Joe concentration camp uh, underneath the uh, refrigerator that the cat made. Um, so every time I read Desmond's name in military font, I always kind of just laugh and I keep thinking IG Joes, IG Joes, you get in there IG Joes. <laughs> um, if you have any questions about this, um, if you want me to do another one, um, that is maybe a pastel one or if you want me to do another voiceover for another tutorial that um, I may have done as a speed demo, then uh, let me know in the comments and I hope you enjoy it. And thanks a lot for watching.